Tonight on To The Point, under arrest, what charges this former Stockton Unified School District president is now facing. Plus, can homeless people be penalized for sleeping outside? Why the U.S. Supreme Court might have the final say. A community concerned, a police officer is back on the force after an FBI investigation. If you sent a message, received a message, laughed at a message, if you didn't report these messages, we don't need you in Antioch. How the police commissioner is responding. And later on the back roads, we head to the spot where fish leave the water for love. Thanks for joining us this evening on To The Point. I'm Becca Habiger. Alex Bell has the night off. And we start tonight with breaking news. A former Stockton Unified School District president is under arrest. The San Joaquin Sheriff's Office says Angelan Flores is facing multiple felony charges following an investigation into theft of public funds and insurance fraud. The investigation started in April of 2023 when the interim superintendent reached out to the sheriff's office over concerns of misuse on Flores' district credit card. The superintendent says more action has been taken since then. In order to restore public trust and ensure um, transparency, the entire board of trustees did relinquish their credit cards on September 14th, 2023 two months into my tenure on my request. We will keep our focus on students and ensuring that they receive the education they deserve. Flores' home was searched. The school board voted her out in December. An investigation is still ongoing and she's expected to be in court next week. Lawyers representing Flores released a statement saying in part, Angel Ann Flores is the victim of political retaliation and is paying the price for raising her voice fighting corruption and for the well-being of Stockton Unified students. They say her home was wrongfully raided. You can read more of their statement on our website, abc10.com. And taking a live look at Golden One Center, Kings fans are hanging out around Doco as the team takes on the Pelicans in New Orleans tonight. The Kings have to win tonight if they want to move on to the playoffs. Our Kings expert Matt George is in New Orleans tonight helping break down why the stakes of tonight's game are so high. I'm Matt George here in beautiful New Orleans where the Sacramento Kings are facing the New Orleans Pelicans in one of these teams' final game of the season. It's the last play-in game in the Western Conference. The winner moves on to the playoffs and a trip to Oklahoma City to take on the Thunder in a best-of-seven series. The loser calls it a season. So much on the line tonight for the Sacramento Kings after a big win over their rival, the Golden State Warriors in Sacramento. Kings need just one more win to keep their playoff hopes alive, but they have to do it against the New Orleans Pelicans team who has absolutely had their number all season long. Five times these teams met during the regular season, which is pretty unusual thanks to the NBA in-season tournament that was introduced this year. So the Kings played the Pelicans five times, lost all five of those games, including here in New Orleans taking on a Pelicans team that was without their star Zion Williamson. Now, the Pelicans will also be without Zion tonight, but Sacramento is playing a different brand of basketball now to when they were earlier in the season when they met the Pelicans. Definitely more of a defensive focused style, which helped them defeat the Golden State Warriors to even get here. If the Kings lose, the season is over. It's back to the drawing board. A disappointing finish after the Kings were third in the Western Conference last year this season fighting for just a playoff spot even though they only had two fewer wins. Well, maybe they can make those up with back-to-back play-in tournament single elimination wins. We'll see if they can get the job done. From New Orleans, Matt George, ABC 10 Sports. Yeah, I think tonight's game is going to be a nail-biter, and it's underway right now. You can find more on the Kings uh, on Matt's Locked on Kings podcast. We'll have a full recap tonight, of course, on Late News tonight at 11. Now, new tonight, a man accused of shooting at a CHP officer is now behind bars. We first brought you this story as breaking news on Wednesday. 41-year-old Manuel Martinez is accused of allegedly shooting at a CHP officer in the area of Southland Way around 4.30 p.m. Wednesday, then barricading himself inside a home. The officer did not shoot back and no one was injured. Martinez is being booked on attempted murder charges. Tonight, a man is dead after he barricaded himself inside a South Sacramento home and set it on fire. 
The sheriff's office says they were called to a domestic violence situation overnight off Arlita Court. They say the suspect had a knife and refused to leave the home. Deputies tried to negotiate and get him to surrender, but instead they say he set the home on fire. Family members were able to get out of the home, and the suspect did die at the hospital. Now, a gas station cashier shot and killed during a Stockton robbery is being described as kind and courageous. Investigators say a group of people robbed a gas station off Arch Road yesterday around 2 a.m. A fight broke out. At least one person fired a gun and killed the 50-year-old employee. Some of his longtime customers are now hoping for justice as the accused robbers are still on the loose. If I needed something to drink or something to eat, he would help you out if you didn't have money, you know, or if you were short, he would say, don't worry about it. The robbers are still on the loose. As we said, police are asking anyone with information to give them or Crime Stoppers a call. Okay, let's talk about cruel and unusual punishment. The Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, of course, bans it, and it's at the heart of a U.S. Supreme Court case that could have a huge impact on California's homelessness crisis. Now, justices will hear a case Monday about fining or arresting people for camping in public spaces. This is being considered the most important case about homelessness in decades. I spoke with a legal expert about what to expect and why the outcome is so important. What this case is about is whether people can be fined and or arrested um, for sleeping outside. Ron Hochbaum teaches at the University of the Pacific's McGeorge School of Law and runs the Homeless Advocacy Clinic there. He says the case going before the U.S. Supreme Court on Monday could have major impacts. I think it's incredibly important. This is the first case that's directly related to the application of criminal law to people experiencing homelessness. The case goes back to 2009 when six unhoused people from Boise, Idaho sued the city over a local ordinance that banned sleeping in public places, arguing there weren't enough shelter beds in the city. In 2018, the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals decided in their favor, known as the Martin v. Boise decision. The three-judge panel said that while communities are allowed to prohibit tents in public spaces, it violates the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment to give people criminal citations for sleeping outside when they have no place else to go. In 2022, in a case challenging restrictions in the city of Grants Pass, Oregon, the Court of Appeals expanded its 2018 ruling, holding that civil citations, not just criminal ones, also can be unconstitutional. The Grants Pass ruling meant for the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, nine states, including California, it is unconstitutional to fine, cite, or arrest someone for camping on public property. The impediments under Grants Pass uh, and the courts have imposed. It's a real issue. In a virtual news conference on Thursday, Governor Newsom reiterated his public stance that he hopes the U.S. Supreme Court will overturn that decision or at least grant a more lenient interpretation. He recalled an encampment he visited in Oakland. Needles strewn everywhere, feces everywhere, no compassion, no compassion whatsoever, leaving people in those conditions when we had an alternative but the judge was saying you can't use that alternative because of this court ruling. So uh, it's very frustrating. Meanwhile, the Sacramento Regional Coalition to End Homelessness says overturning the decision would amount to criminalizing homelessness and people's attempts to survive. When we see cities move in this direction of criminalization, of ticketing, citing and arresting um, folks instead, it it just, it's a, it's a values question. Nikki Jones is the coalition's executive director and on the Sacramento Homeless Organizing Committee. She says criminalizing homelessness keeps people in the cycle of homelessness. When you have a criminal record, it is harder to obtain housing. It's harder to obtain the necessary services. Now the Sacramento Regional Coalition to End Homelessness is holding a rally at noon Monday outside the federal courthouse here in Sacramento. Now in 14 cities nationwide, homeless advocacy groups will be holding similar rallies on Monday. They want to urge the Supreme Court to uphold the appellate court's ruling. Well, still ahead on To The Point, a year after a texting scandal, why a police officer is back on the force. We are tracking pop-up thunderstorms in the foothills and Sierra. How long it'll last. And later on the back roads, we head to Southern California for a nighttime expedition for a fish leaving the ocean for love.
Oh, well, tomorrow's picnic day. The UC Davis tradition, which includes family-friendly activities and a parade, attracts tens of thousands of people to the university. But also, if you're driving in the area, you'll want to watch out for traffic. It's going to be pretty crowded. Mm -hmm. Carly, yeah. our meteorologist joins us here, Carly Gomez. We're looking at a very nice weekend for picnic day. It's going to be warm, so grab the sunscreen, a nice blanket outside, light clothing. We're talking temperatures in the mid to low 80s this weekend, so it'll be warm out there. Please dress accordingly. We are looking at rivers running very cold. Cold. As we see a lot of that water coming off the mountains into our rivers, creeks and streams, it's going to make for very cold waters. Even though it feels sunny and hot outside, the water is very cold. You can get hypothermia very quickly. Onshore flow is bringing breezy conditions, so at least it'll make it feel a little cooler out there. And a slight chance for foothill thunderstorms still happening this evening, although we're going to start seeing them clearing out. Now, we are looking at a heat risk this weekend, mostly minor, going to affect mostly extremely sensitive, those who, who are extremely sensitive to heat, especially when you're outdoors or you're not getting effective cooling, so make sure you're just staying hydrated. We are looking here at a low pressure system moving into the Pacific Northwest and portions of Canada, but otherwise the low to the south is what's bringing us those pop-up cumulus clouds and thunderstorm chances, but again, we're seeing a high pressure system in place this weekend, which will bring us those 80s and even early uh, low 80s into early next week on Monday. Most of the pop-up thunderstorm chances are moving to the southeast. Now, winds about 15 to 20 miles per hour in the valley, and that'll continue for your Saturday, as well as even Sunday, about 5 to 10 mile per hour winds here in the valley, and then we'll start seeing things slowing down into next week. Now, overhead, mostly sunny skies again. We're still looking at a few of those pop-up showers there into those foothill spots. Otherwise, we'll see a little bit of cloud coverage overnight with clearing tomorrow, nice into the foothills as well, into your week and nice and warm. And then we'll expect to see a little bit of high elevation clouds coming in for your Monday, but again, mostly sunny. Mid-80s turn mid-70s and upper upper 60s next Thursday with sunshine the following weekend. Carly, thanks so much. Packing the water and electrolytes tomorrow. Well, next on to the point, a police officer reinstated after a texting scandal investigation. Plus, what's in a $95 billion foreign aid package moving forward in Congress? New developments tonight in a police texting scandal investigated by the FBI. More than 40% of the force in Antioch was placed on paid leave. Well, now we're learning that one of the sergeants involved will be returning to work. Ansar Hassan reports. Antioch resident Frank Sterling's 2009 encounter with then Antioch police officer Rick Hoffman left him hospitalized. He was awarded compensation as part of a settlement alleging excessive use of force. Last year, Hoffman, now a sergeant, was put on paid leave after being linked to the police texting scandal. Now he's coming back. Well, definitely we're all very upset that Rick Hoffman's come back. He's known for committing violence in the community. He's mentioned in the text message scandal laughing at violence. Last year, an FBI investigation uncovered a racist texting scandal at the Antioch Police Department. Documents from the FBI and the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office show Rick Hoffman on a series of text chains that use racist, misogynistic, and homophobic language and memes. If you sent a message, received a message, laughed at a message, if you didn't report these messages, we don't need you in Antioch. ABC 7 News has learned that an investigation was conducted which cleared Hoffman to return. That could include a demotion in rank, but details of the investigation haven't been made public. They're back on the force, so were, were there no findings in this investigation? Um, why hasn't there been any uh, disclosure on that? Why hasn't the, 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 the public been made aware? And why has, you know, it, it felt like a secret? Antioch Police Commissioner Devin Williams says he's troubled by the lack of transparency. Despite being on leave, Hoffman is still listed as the president of the Antioch Police Officers Association. Documents from the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office show Hoffman was the ranking officer who cleared some officers for use of force. The FBI later indicted officers in those same cases. Williams says he's concerned about how this will influence new recruits. The culture, right, of the department, our new police chief Addington is saying that he wants to have a, a culture of accountability but that hasn't been shown in the past, so how can you ensure that this will be the new way going forward? In an email to ABC 7 News, Interim Police Chief Brian Addington writes, I can confirm that Officer Rick Hoffman is employed as an Antioch police officer. A source tells ABC 7 News it was Addington who made the decision to bring back Hoffman. Commissioner Williams now wants to call Hoffman before the police commission. 
we're not here to, you know, have a hearing, but you know, we want to have some, some, some answers. We want to see if his, if his, his character has changed, right, for the for the benefit of us all. Now to the latest on former President Donald Trump's criminal trial. A jury of 12, seven men and five women have been sworn in now. After seating one alternate juror yesterday, five others were seated today. Together, the jurors will decide whether Trump is guilty of falsifying business records related to a 2016 hush money payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. Trump has pleaded not guilty and denied any wrongdoing. Opening statements could begin next week. Tonight, Congress is one step closer to passing foreign aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. In a 316 to 94 vote, the House advanced four bills as part of a $95 billion package. It includes roughly $26 billion in aid to Israel, almost $61 billion in aid to Ukraine, $8 billion in aid to the Indo-Pacific, and an act with conservative priorities, such as a TikTok ban bill and sanctions on Iran. The House will debate the aid bills and amendments tomorrow morning before voting to send it to the Senate. Well, it's Friday, which means it's time for another trip on the back roads. Tonight, John Bartel takes us on a nighttime expedition to catch a mysterious fish that leaves the ocean to find love. When the moon and the tide is just right in Los Angeles County, flocks of black crowned night herons start to gather along the shores in San Pedro. So this is uh, Cabrillo Beach, outer Cabrillo Beach. That's also when Jim DePompe heads to the beach. So we have a permit this evening to, to collect about 10 grunion fish so that we can um, try and keep them in captivity. Jim is with the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, and tonight a small group of curious spectators have come to help him catch the protected grunion fish. It's very exciting. I've always wanted to come to one of these, and now I've been able to show up, so it's like the best thing ever for me. Jim doesn't use a net, a fishing pole, or a boat for that matter. Oh, yeah, you can, coming now we're coming here. Okay, this is good. Now we're building. And that's because the grunion fish come to him. But if you look out in the water, you'll see there's even more grunion out there shining in the water out there, just waiting to come up onto the beach. You are witnessing the annual grunion run. These little six inch swimmers are among the only fish in the world who beach themselves on purpose. And it's all in the name of love. What is sex on the beach? The love session you are witnessing only takes place between the months of February and August. It only happens a few nights a year, and the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium invites the public to witness what quite possibly could be the oddest mating ritual in the marine world. So here we, here we have a couple females dug in the sand. Here we have a male wrapped around the female. That male is depositing milt. You mentioned the word milt. Mil what, what is milt? Is it, that... It's just another name for sperm. Sperm, okay, yeah. all right. To better explain what is going on below the sand, Jim took me inside the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. And as you add the water, you should see the eggs pop out of the sand. Jim says grunion need to lay eggs and fertilize them in dry sand. And the only way to do that is when the moon is just right and the tide is at its highest. And it knows when it's the new moon and full moon. And it comes up a couple of days after the new moon and the full moon. During the full moon and high tide, the grunion lay and fertilize eggs. When the tide starts to recede, those grunion eggs start to develop. It, it's literally just kind of happening in my hand here. Here's where the magic happens. 10 to 15 days later, a new moon brings back the high tide again, and the water triggers the eggs to hatch. And then eventually the water will reach it again and remove the sand and the little babies will hatch out. Grunion is easy prey for birds, and that's one reason they're protected. Humans can fish for grunion, but the season has strict regulations and only lasts a few days a year. And she can be out of water for five, ten minutes or so and just be totally fine. Lucky for these grunion, they're headed to the aquarium, where they'll be studied and displayed to the public for educational purposes. Yeah. Very unique. They're, they're the only known fish that digs in the sand out of the water to lay their eggs. From the Grunion Run in San Pedro.
I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back roads. Wow, isn't nature something? Well, do you have something in your town that would be great for a road trip destination? Please let John know by texting your idea to 916-321-3310. We'll be right back. Well, people are calling it the cicada apocalypse. Millions of cicadas are about to emerge from the ground, but don't worry, it's not happening here. Coming up on Monday on To The Point, we're getting into the science behind these insects and why we don't experience a big emergence like the East Coast is about to see. Thanks so much for watching and inviting us into your home. We hope you have a great night and a safe weekend. Go Kings! Hey, it's Alex. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching the To The Point team and I love hearing from you and I hope that you'll stay in touch. And don't forget, you can always email me and the team at to the point at abc10.com or you can even send us a text message at 916-321-3310.